Hello and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Alec Ruit and I'm the host for today's talk. Today's speaker is Melle Groen. Melle is a PhD candidate in linguistics at the University of Tübingen in Germany, where he works on complement classes in a variety of languages, including the Germanic languages. In general, his research interests include morphology and syntax of the languages of the world, with a specific focus on linguistic variation. He finished his research master in linguistics at Leiden University last year, with his master thesis on the syntactic properties of event normalizations in Iraq, which also will be the topic of his uh, talk today. So please join me in welcoming Mella as he gives his talk, Normalized Verbs and Their Arguments in Iraq. Uh, right. Mella, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you all for uh, having me. And uh, indeed, today I will be talking about normalizations and their arguments in Iraq. Um, so, Iraq is a language that belongs to the South Cushitic branch of the Afro-Asiatic uh, language family, and it's spoken in northern Tanzania, in um, the region that you can see here on this map. And there is roughly half a million speakers, and the language is quite closely related to other um, Cushitic languages in the in the area, such as Gorwa, uh, Burunga, and uh, Alagwa. So. Um, and so today I would like to talk to you about normalizations in, in this language. Um, so in, like in many other languages, nominals that denote events can be derived from uh, verbs. For example, in English, if you have a verb walk, you can derive a nominal uh, walking. And these um, event nominals have certain uh, verbal properties uh, as well as uh, nominal properties. Um, but one particular property that they uh, don't have is the ability to express uh, arguments. Um, however, there are a few other uh, strategies that Iraq has to express uh, arguments of, of event nominals. And one of them is that they can be expressed as arguments of the main clause instead. Uh, and of course, we'll go in, in more detail in this uh, later. But so this is the main uh, kind of uh, thing that we're going to be talking about. So how do we analyze this? property and what are the implications for linguistic theory. Um, but first, before we can really uh, delve into the properties of these event nominals, we have to go through a few basic uh, properties of Iraq in general, and particularly the structure, the general structure of the clause. So the clause structure of Iraq is uh, characterized by basically two uh, elements, which are called the selector and the verb, uh, which are both obligatory in most uh, types of clauses, or verbal clauses, that is. And um, basically, the selector is an element that always precedes the verb, and it consists of various functional morphemes that express different grammatical categories, such as uh, agreements, uh, tense aspect moods, uh, etc. Whereas the verb, which always follows the selector, is marked for aspect and voice, and also subject implements, as well as tense and moods. And so we have an example here. Uh, here we see the selector marked in orange has a, a marker G that, uh, like a, this guy that marks um, the third person uh, object. And in this uh, case, it it's basically expresses that there's a third person subject acting upon a third person object. Then there is a marker that, uh, or a phenomenal clitic that marks that the object is a neuter in gender and also a past tense marker. And then after that, we have the verb marked in blue, which is marked for aspects, uh, causative and also uh, subject agreement. And basically these two elements, the selector and the verb, divide the clause into um, different uh, domains. And uh, these domains are really strictly separate in terms of which elements can occur in which domain. Um, so, um, so Anna has just shared uh, a, a document in the in the chat, which has a, a small overview of some of the kind of basic aspects of your uh, grammar that are useful for this talk. So, um, feel free to open that and uh, have a look at it. Okay, so then. What about nominalizations? So in Iraq, you can derive nominals from verbs using various different uh, suffixes. So for example, from dos, which means dig, you can derive a noun digging with the suffix ah, dosa. And from da, 
which means sing, you can get that um, uh, with a different suffix and, and so forth. There's um, various suffixes. And the the resulting nominals, event nominals, generally they basically have all nominal properties. So they can be used as arguments of verbs and it can be uh, nominal modifiers, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and they actually have a number of verbal properties as well, which includes, for example, these uh, causative, middle, and aspect suffixes, the derivational suffixes that you get on verbs can also be present in event nominals. Um, furthermore, they can be modified by uh, adverbs, a subset of adverbs, such as in the example on the left here, Nagro Viso, is secretly stealing. And it can also be modified by phrases with so-called uh, adverbial clinics, uh, which are kind of like uh, postpositional phrases. So in this case, Akora uh, Visa. Uh, stealing from grandfather. So they have a, a couple of verbal properties, but uh, they do not have the ability to express uh, or license uh, arguments. Um, so if we have this example here, where you have maze and then digging, this cannot be uh, interpreted as or like digging or cultivating, just cultivating maize, but rather the maize of cultivation. But okay, so this example is a little hard to parse. Uh, and in order to really understand it, we have to go into another aspect of your grammar, which is the uh, called construct state. So basically, nouns in Iraq have a specific form, which is called construct states, and is marked by an additional suffix. And this form uh, occurs in two morphosyntactic environments. Um, one of them is when the noun is followed by a nominal modifier, such as an adjective or possessor or sometimes a numeral. And the second uh, environment is when the noun is an object in the preverbal domain, so in between the selector and the verb. And the form of this construct state depends on the noun, and it's also correlated strongly with gender. So for each gender, there is one or two, one or two different construct states forms that a noun can have. So, yeah, so let's look at that. So, for example, if the noun is followed by an adjective, possessor, or another modifier, you get the construct state. Um, for example, hara is stick, and then if you want to modify that with an adjective, a big stick, then you get the construct state suffix ta. ta ur. And also, in the other example, if you have a noun, uh, she meaning cow, if you want to modify that with the possessor, grandfather's cow, then similarly you get the construct state there. And then the second environment we see here, and the, um, is when the noun is the object in the pre-verbal domain. So um, in the first example here, uh, we see that the, the object clothes is, uh, of course, before the selector in the pre-selector domain, and it does not have the construct state. But then in the second example, we see the noun in between the selector and the verb. And here, we get the construct state suffix a. And the difference here basically comes down to uh, information structure. Well, that's um, yeah, something uh, for a different talk. OK, so with that in mind, if you look back at this example, we see a noun with construct state followed by an event nominal. And so this configuration can only be interpreted as um, possessive construct possessor, so possessive construction. So basically, the maze of the cultivation. So that basically means the maze that is to be cultivated. But it cannot mean the cultivation of maize, cultivating maize. Uh, so this the the second uh, environment in which the construct state occurs, namely as a pre-verbal object. Is not this this reading is not available here. Um, so basically, the event nominals cannot uh, license objects, you could say, and this is of course not strange or unique to Iraq because it's well known that nominalizations show differences both across different languages and also within different within a language in terms of which verbal properties they have and don't have, including whether they license arguments or not. So, for example, in English. If you compare uh, normalization with this ing suffix, refusing the offer, 
you can say her refusing the offer surprised everyone. So there the object can be licensed. But if you have a different type of normalization, namely refusal, then suddenly her refusal, the offer, surprise everyone doesn't work. You need the off there. And so the Iraq uh, event nominals seem similar to the refusal type in English where they don't license an object. Um, but like in many other languages which have these kinds of restrictions, there's other strategies that you can use to express thematic relations between a nominalized verb and a uh, nominal. Um, and one of these is, for example, a event nominal may have a possessor that is thematically related. So if we recall the possessive construction where you have possessee, construct state, possessor, then you can use that with event nominals also. So for example, uh, First example here, killing the cow is bad, basically is the cow's killing, or killing of the cow, where the cow is thematically the, the, the patient of the killing. And then in the other example, uh, you see a possessor, a possessor suffix, which you can use if the possessor is just, uh, yeah, for example, here, second person singular, uh, I want your seeing, basically, I want to see you. Um, and one one thing that's that's worth noting is that it's pretty clear that here the possessor is not actually an argument of the if it's nominal. It's just because this is the possessor, and also the relationship between the event nominal and the possessor is not uh, fixed. So it's not limited to only being the theme or the patients of the event nominal, for example. Right. And then another strategy that Iraq uses to express. Uh, uh, the, the, the arguments of the event nominals is that they can be expressed as arguments of the main clause instead. And there's a couple of different constructions, yes? namely with um, the ablative clitic, wa, or with the topic marker, uh, oh. But uh, unfortunately, I realized that uh, we probably don't have time to talk about all of these. Um, so we'll be focusing on what I think is the most intriguing one of these, which is. Um, where the event nominal is occurs in the pre-verbal domain in the construct state. And so let's get into uh, this construction. So here again, we see the example that we saw in the beginning, Balan goes left out, um, which means I'm going to dig the grains, basically to cultivate the, the grains. And what we see here is that the event nominal is before the verb with the construct state, and then the theme of the event nominal is the object of the main clause. And you can tell that that is the case because one is, is in a different uh, domain, is in a pre-selector domain. And also the selector has this masculine object marker, U, which refers back to the, uh, the grains. Uh, and this construction is common with, particularly with the verb uh, to go, where it's, it's kind of similar to, for example, go to cultivate grains in, in English. Uh, but also with some other verbs like uh, to want. And yeah, so if we compare that again to the uh, schematic of the, the clause structure that we saw earlier, we see that the, the theme of the event nominal is in the pre-selective domain and the event nominal itself is in the pre-verbal domain with the construct state. And one thing that's worth noting here is that the first object of the main clause, so the 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 yeah the grains in this in this case this can only be interpreted as the theme of the event moment or the patient and not as any other kind of thematic relationship so for example if you have a sentence like this um then uh with the noun uh, boys at the start then this can only be interpreted as i want to dig the boys which doesn't really make any sense um but so in a different interpretation, like for example, I want the boys to dig, um, is not available here. And this indicates that um, there's really quite a close relationship between the, the object and the event nominal in this case. So that the first object is really kind of an argument of the normalized verb. So then the question is, why does it end up here in the argument position in the main clause? And so, as we've seen already, the event nominals themselves do not license arguments. Um, so, 
you, we could hypothesize that um, the, the object in this construction is originally is an object of the normalized verb, but because it's going to be licensed, it needs to move to a different position in the main clause in order to um, have it be licensed by the main verb. Or uh, this, is, this is kind of a generativist uh, analysis and in other terms, you could say, be assigned case in the generative sense. Um, in any, anyway, however you want to analyze this, um, there, there's a problem that emerges, which is that if the first object, so the grains, is licensed in this way by the main verb, then how is this event nominal actually licensed? And Or alternatively, in more descriptive terms, you could state this problem as, how come that this configuration with two objects it's possible if the second one is an event nominal and the first one is the theme of the event nominal, but not with two regular nominals, because generally there's no diatransitive verbs in, in Iraq. Um, so this is really a different type of construction that um, yeah, is different from the behavior of regular nominals. And the answer, I think, uh, is that in this construction, the event nominal is not actually a nominal and thus it doesn't need to be licensed. And in fact, it behaves more like a non finite verb. And there's actually some more evidence for, for this idea. Namely that um, if you have this kind of construction, the event nominal cannot be modified by an adjective. Um, so in this example here, um, you can you can try to add an adjective easy to the um, to the event nominal, and the result is is not acceptable. So you cannot say this uh, to say I'm going to so easily cultivate grains, and this is not actually due to any semantic restriction or restriction on event nominals in general, because. You can also use the same construction with uh, the verb to go with an event nominal that precedes it, which is not, um, and, and then there's not uh, a different object. Uh, for example, this first example here. So if you say, she is going to sing beautifully, you can modify the event nominal with an adjective, and, and this is fine. But as soon as you add an additional object here, and so the problem emerges, that's how, is there, how can there be two objects, then suddenly the adjectival modification of the event nominal is no longer possible. So to me, this really uh, indicates that indeed the event nominal is not actually syntactically a nominal in this uh, construction. Um, yeah, so then we can, so based on that, uh, we can say that um, the event nominal e is not actually nominal, but rather just a kind of non finite verb. And in fact, if you compare this construction to uh, European languages which, with uh, infinitives, you see very similar properties, which is referred to as uh, restructuring, where, for example, the object of uh, a non finite clause acts as the object of the main clause instead. Um, but if we make this assumption, we run into uh, another question, and that is why, if this is not a nominal, why does it have nominalizing morphology? And this question actually is quite relevant for kind of one of the main uh, crucial questions, I, I would say, in morphosyntax, which is how are words uh, formed in the first place? So, um, especially within, uh, let's say, the generative paradigm, but also, I guess, to some extent, outside of that, um, you can kind of distinguish two main opinions on this, which are, on one hand, the lexicalist view, which roughly says that morphologically complex words are formed in the lexicon. So you have a lexicon, which is where the words are stored, and then you use those to make syntactic uh, structures. But then on the other hand, you have um, what could be broadly called non-lexicalist views, which say that actually morphologically complex words are not formed in the lexicon but in the syntax. So basically the same operations that make complex sentences also make morphologically complex words. Um, and so this is something that has a few implications, namely that 
the building blocks of synthesizers are not actually worse, but rather they're equivalent to morphemes or actually smaller units. And it also implies that the morphology reflects the syntactic structure. So if you see a morpheme, there should also be a corresponding element um, in the syntax. Um, and this view is actually, I would say, quite popular now in uh, generativist uh, paradigm. So, for example, in the field of uh, distributed morphology, and the, basically the view that 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 is common in this field is that normalization is, is a syntactic process, and the way that it works is that a normalized word, and in fact uh, any kind of nominal, is formed uh, by merging a root or some verbal structure with um, a nominal category depending head, which is is commonly labeled uh, little n. Um, and then, so if you see in the morphology a normalizing suffix, then that indicates that this um, that this nominal head is there. So this basically the suffix reflects or spells out the the head of the syntax. And so, kind of the implication of this is that if you see a normalizing suffix, that also entails that the the word should have nominal syntactic properties because morphology reflects the syntax. But now, if you go back to our example, then uh, this kind of um, poses a problem for this kind of analysis. So because the event nominals in this split object construction have a normalizing suffix, but they do not have the actual syntactic properties that nominals have because they occur in a position where nominals regularly don't occur. In this configuration with another object, and also they cannot be modified by adjectives. Um, so that is one. And an additional problem is that they have the construct state, which is another piece of nominal morphology aside from just the nominalizer. And this construct state is an exclusively nominal thing, and it's also linked to gender, as we saw earlier, which is a nominal property. So it seems that we have a yeah, uh, a word that is uh, morphologically a noun, but syntactically uh, a verb, or yeah, a non finite verb, which is a problem. So, um, this is something that I, yeah, that I have trouble with in my, my thesis, and I, I'm afraid I don't have a great answer for it. Um, so, kind of to, yeah, to, to, to finish that. Um, consider an aspect that we haven't really talked about so far, and that often kind of goes and talks about in formal syntactic theory, which is the diachronic dimension to this. So um, basically, you can see this construction of Iraq as the development from um, a nominalized verb into uh, a non-finite verb, which is not nominal, so basically an infinitive. And this is not something that is unique to Iraq, of course, because in fact, is very common across languages for infinitives to develop from event nominals. And like a particularly common pathway for this to happen is via uh, an event nominal that is in the scalative or dative, which then develops into a purposive, and then from that you get the infinitive. And so in this, um, yeah, if you consider this, it's quite uh, expectable that many languages will have the stage where you have the same morphological marker for both event nominals and infinitives. And so there are, for example, in, yeah, so there's, there's quite a few languages where you see, for example, also Celtic languages or similar thing. Um, so in principle, this doesn't have to be a problem for these kind of non-lexicalist or like syntactic frameworks uh, syntactic approaches to morphology, because you could say, for example, so when you have an event nominal with nominalizing suffix, uh, if as soon as that loses its nominal properties and develops into a non simply a non-finite verb, then you can say that what used to be a nominalizing suffix no longer spells out the nominal head, but instead now is some other syntactic uh, category. Um, however, this kind of yeah, weakens the argument because it goes against the principle of morphology reflecting the syntax. And especially for languages like Europe, which have a lot of different nominalizer suffixes. So basically, if you have only one suffix that's used to normalize verbs, then it's kind of easy to say, okay, and at a certain point, 
this is no longer a normalizing suffix, but just an infinitive suffix, and it reflects something else like uh, non finite uh, T or something like that. Um, but if you have a language like Iraq, where you have a lot of different normalizing suffixes that depend on the noun, then it, it's sort of not very elegant to say. So for each noun, you have the same suffix that is either nominal, nominalizing, or infinite, infinitival. Uh, and there's no synchronic connection to those. Um, another problem with this is that how do you account for other vestiges of normal topology, like, for example, this construct phase that we mentioned? Um, right. So, basically, to conclude, um, in this split object construction where you have uh, an event nominal and then an argument of the main clause that is the theme of the event nominal. Um, the event nominal is not actually a nominal, syntactically speaking, but rather it is more like a non finite verb. But this actually raises some problems for theoretical frameworks that normalization as a purely syntactic phenomenon. Um, so, some questions for future research that would be important to figure out before we can really say more about this are for one, uh, do these uh, even nominals and split object constructions really not have any nominal properties, or are there some nominal properties that they do have? So, so far, I, I, I only talked about adjectives, but then the question is what about other modifiers, for example, or other nominal morphology that they might have? So, and this is something that still needs uh, more data, I think. And another very important question is what is actually this construct state suffix? So, um, if you want to explain how does this nominal suffix occur in uh, a, a, a nominal and a non nominal uh, non finite verb, uh, what is it then? So, for example, Harvey, uh, Andrew Harvey says in, for Gorma that the construct state is actually a kind of a determiner that marks referentiality, um, which which would mean that there is it, it, it reflects a, a further part of nominal structure. Um, but then there's also some data that kind of goes against it. Um, so in general, I think this is something that still needs more research. Um, and then some questions that we could discuss about are for one, how well, yeah, how do we account for these web models that have nominal morphology but not nominal syntax? Is it, is it a problem or uh, is it not a problem? And what are the implications um, for these theoretical models that see normalization as a syntactic process? Um, I'm also very curious to hear if you have uh, insights from other types of uh, frameworks and models of syntax and morphology. So how would the distance model account for this phenomenon? And also, I'm always um, curious to hear if there's similar phenomena in other languages. And with that, uh, yeah, I'd like to thank you very much. And uh, yeah, I appreciate any questions or comments that you might have. Thank you so much for your very interesting presentation. So we can go straight into the question and answer section. Um, as always, you can either leave a question in the chat or you can raise your hand and I will send you a request to unmute. Please remember that all of the webinars are being recorded, so any question you ask will be part of the recording and will be released on the YouTube channel. Um, at the moment that you see some applauding hands, I see. So I Thank think you. I yeah. might start with a question of my own. Um, mm -hmm. So there are quite a lot of different normalizers uh, in Iraq. Uh, did you find exactly the same syntactic behavior across the board, or was there any uh, differentiation between them that you found? So, um, yeah, it's um, okay. I was going to go back, but it's too far. Okay, yeah. So there's a, a number of different suffixes, um, but for the most part, there doesn't seem to be a correlation between the syntactic properties and, and the form of the suffix. So, for example, there's a lot of different suffixes, and they all used to form these events, denoting nominals. Um, and it basically um, depends on the, uh, yeah, the verb, pretty much. However, there is a difference uh, for some nouns. So, some nouns can actually have different normalizing suffixes. Uh, and then, in that case, sometimes it's the case that some that one suffix is used for uh, event for a nominal that denotes an event. 
whereas the other one is used for a number that denotes the result of an action. So, um, uh, and this is some something that you do see uh, difference between different suffixes. But um, yeah, in general, uh, no, I would say. And in general, in this construction, um, the yeah the the form that's that's used in this particular construction is exactly the same as the um, whatever form whatever suffix is used for regular event denoting uh, nominals. But yeah, thank you. I don't see that Andrew raised his hands. Thanks, Mela. I have a couple uh, comments. My mm -hmm. first, well, a comment and a question. My first one is, I think I, I agree with you. I think that the work that Liz Kerr did and that you did uh, in your dissertation uh, provides some pretty compelling proof that the uh, that this that this linker, this construct state morphology, it, it, you know, I, I identified it as having to do with reference in some broad sense, but it seems that the evidence that you and Liz have, have presented is pretty compelling that it's more complicated than that. Uh, so I think, I think that that's pretty convincing mm -hmm. uh, on uh, your side. I was thinking this, uh, this sort of division between infinitive and nominalized verbs here. And I started thinking, and I think it's the same for Iraq. I mean, Gorwa and Iraq are relatively the same. But when I think about infinitives in Gorwa, I often say there are no infinitives in Gorwa. There are just nominalized verbs. So you talked about diachrony. You talked a little bit about syntax. I mean, what does that mean for, you know, I mean, for the situation that you described? I mean, when we talk about forms that, yeah, forms acting as infinitives or infinitivals in a system that doesn't have really sort of canonical infinitives. Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely. Uh, yeah, from what I from what I've seen, I, I feel like it's the case in Europe as well. Yeah, I think I maybe say more about this that, that there is no. Uh, category of, of infinitive, yeah. there's the nominalized verbs, and there's a few other types of verbal forms like uh, the participles, which are more like, like adjectives, and uh, a few other things, but no, nothing that clearly corresponds to uh, the notion of infinitive in, in languages or non finite clauses. Um, but yeah, so what I use the term infinitive here, it's kind of um, so. so in the sense that, so in this construction, since this apparently nominalized verb doesn't seem to have nominal syntactic properties, you could kind of see it as the emerging, uh, uh, like kind of a, a new category of infinitive, of infinitive emerging from nominalized verbs. Um, so, no, I feel like, you, like I said, I feel like, that, oh, sorry. Hmm? Do we know of any languages that just don't, uh, that lack a category of infinitive? Yeah, so one um, parallel to this, which I uh, also went into in my thesis, is uh, Celtic languages like uh, Scottish Gaelic. So um, these languages also have this have a have a category that's called they refer to as verbal noun, and they are uh, generally correspond to events uh, nominals. Uh, but uh, and but similarly to to Iraq, they're also used in a couple of constructions for environments where nom nom uh, yeah normal nominals do not actually occur. Uh, and and that's and there they behave really much more like infinitives in in other languages. Um, so that would be another example of a language where uh, there's there's no where infinitives and and uh, nominalized verbs are not strictly separated categories, uh, at least uh, morphologically speaking. And um, yeah, like I said, I think in a lot of languages. So we know that, for example, in, in, in European languages, but um, also I think in, in multiple languages, right, it, it's infinitive and developed from um, kind of relative or dative uh, nominals. And so it makes sense that you would have a stage where, yeah, you basically have a, a situation that's similar to Scottish Gaelic or, or Iraq, where there's no seemingly no 
distinction morphologically between the infinitives of two modern verbs. Um, but yeah, okay, I don't know. That's yeah. <laughs> it's a brilliant question. observation, but, Mila. No, I don't expect you to provide the answer right away, right, but I mean, right, it's a brilliant okay. observation. It's something that I think I'd put my finger on, but I'd never really sat down and thought about it. And I think that the way that you present it is really, you know, I, I yeah, I think it's great. Okay, well, thank you very much. Okay, so, so Martin? Uh, there were more points of Andrew, but I have a reaction oh, to sorry. this particular point. So mm -hmm. I'm happy to... Uh, to, to to talk now, <clears throat> um, uh, yeah, I, I uh, uh, and Andrew, I think that's that's a really interesting thing that you raise about uh, the no infinitives and um, the is though the 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 thing that you have several nominal you can have very easily several nominalizations of the same verb, uh, and one of them will be able to act as event nominal. So, so that is an important thing to take into account. So if one of those nominalization has a lexicalized meaning, the verb to climb, you get a meaning mm -hmm. of ladder, then that form can no longer act in the properties that that, that Meller showed. That doesn't make it necessarily infinitive, but it makes it a special kind of uh, nominalized verb. And, and I think what is, what, what yeah, sort of makes Iraku special and pleads a little bit against the, the, the simple um, grammaticalization clients that we saw is that in uh, the, the, the actual, and Amela said that the actual shape of the nominalization, that doesn't play a role. So it's the A or the O or the ang, mm -hmm. that doesn't play a role. So it is not a particular morpheme that develops in a certain sense. It's what I thought in the beginning of my studies. I thought it was the A ah was the in, yeah, infinitive and the other ones were different nominalizations, but that is simply incorrect. So uh, that is an, another challenge, I think, to, to see it as a, as a standard kind of grammaticalization historical development, because it's, it it is the construction rather than a morphine that plays a uh, role here. Mm -hmm. That's what I wanted to react, to, but I, I'm curious to hear the other points that we go ahead. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's that's a very good point. That um, it, the, it, but yeah, the, there's a lot of different suffixes that can be used to uh, to form these uh, uh, yeah normalized verbs, and it's not just one normalizer, but this is yeah. And there's a bunch of different ones. And that's, yeah, definitely important uh, to keep in mind when analyzing this. But yeah, okay, thank you. Can I have another comment then? Of course. I mean, I, it's not a com I don't know. Uh, uh, I was re uh, listening again, Mella, and uh, I, I'm really uh, impressed in how, how clear you, 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 you put all these complex things. Thank you. Um, the... Uh, Sometimes I think about uh, a, a, a kind of uh, solution that we see the, the noun in construct state plus the verb as an incorporated verb. So as, as one thing and mm -hmm. as a kind of verb. And, uh, and, and then we cannot talk about maybe many of the properties of that that uh, that noun anymore but mm -hmm. it, it does it does become logical then that the the object becomes the object of the main clause mm -hmm. how, how about is that a line is that maybe is that a line that you're thinking or uh, what 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 is your reaction to that right so i think that it, it, it's definitely an idea that makes a lot of sense. And I think this also especially makes sense if you compare it to uh, construction with infin infinitives in other languages, because with infinitives, it's very common that you get these effects where basically the infinitive and the the, the, the main inflected verb kind of act as one uh, predicate, right? Hmm. Um, and so in the generativist literature, uh, although I'm not very well versed on this, but this, this is kind of this is referred to as the restructuring, where basically the idea is you have two 
clauses, but they get structured kind of into one clause with one predicate. Um, yeah, so this is something that if we want to see this as kind of a non-finite verb, it, it's pretty easy to um, analyze it in this way. But if you consider this to be a, a true nominal, then it becomes more, more complicated, I think. Um, or like, hmm, so you, you could, yeah. Because the thing is, um, you talk about it being kind of like incorporated, but then of course, Iraq also has this other incorporation construction, right? Which is which is quite different. That's um, why I never went there, but... Um... Yeah, I, I also decided not to go into it here. But um, yeah, it's kind of... Hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know. It's, it's, um, yeah. Hmm. I feel like, yeah, you have to do, yeah, think more about this in order to okay. really, like, come up with a way to accommodate this this notion. It, it also depends on what kind of theoretical uh, framework you're working with, or what kind of uh yeah kind of theory you want to accommodate this notion in um so that yeah that plays a role as well um but overall i think it's a very like good uh notion and it's it and it's one way in which this construction really is reminiscent of infinitives um but then yeah the problem remains how do you analyze this nominal morphology in there Anyway, thank you. Yeah, it does help. I mean, some of these some of these observations that came out as almost incidental to this presentation. I mean, are really interesting and useful. Mm -hmm. um, the infinitives mm -hmm. was one thing. I mean, the mention that you make of the fact that there are, are you know, that this idea of ditransitive verbs in Iraq mm -hmm. being either rare or non-existent. Mm -hmm. Again, mm -hmm. the idea of 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 verb valency and things like that. You know, you think yeah. about it, but it's yeah, I would. I, yeah, it just sort of it stands out in the in in the middle, and you think to yourself, "Oh gosh, okay, all right, that's something that I need to think about." Um, so yeah. yeah, I mean, super valuable. Um, the fact that you know these things sort of came out of your analysis um, as sort of incidental, but are are kind of worth, um, you know, I mean, these are full uh, PhD dissertations in and of themselves, right? Well, thank you, and. Yeah, it's it's it is interesting what you say also about these that transfers because there are quite a few like other like constructions or configurations that that do look similar and it does seem like you have an additional object but but they're all quite different. So what I what I found is that this particular configuration where you have one object in the pre-selector domain and another noun that's just kind of a bare noun in the with the liquor, with the construct state in the, the pre-verbal domain is, a, is something that only really works with this event nominal construction. Whereas if, if this other noun did not have the linker and was uh, incorporated, then then that's that that would be fine. That's another possibility, um, which is also an interesting topic, I think, to further uh, look into. Um, but yeah, so this so yeah, so this construction really seems kind of uh, unique in that sense and yeah like you say that's in itself also um yeah plays a role in in uh, how you analyze argument structure or valency in general in uh, in this language but yeah um still a lot to be learned about these suffixes as well because yeah. it's true that gorwa iraq has this large range of nominal suffixes mm -hmm. But I, I'm pretty sure you mentioned not all of these nominal suffixes can be used to do event nominalizations. Um, and then you mentioned uh, you mentioned these compounds, these very tight, you know, uh, incorporations. If we want to mention that, mm -hmm. not every noun suffix. So not every noun with a certain noun suffix can be used for noun for that kind of tight compound okay. corporation either okay that's interesting that's something that i wasn't that i wasn't really aware of um 
What what do you have in mind, Andrew, for the last? So point? for so for example, if we're talking about if we're talking about, um, I'm trying to think of the tightest examples of uh, of uh, incorporation now, not these larger grammatical elements. I'm okay, trying to think okay, okay. of okay. an example now mm -hmm. uh, that we would think of as compounds. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But um, not every noun is available to be compounded in that very tight way. Yeah, that's and true. to me, it looks like it seems to be the nominal suffix that's determining that. You can't have, so in my dissertation, I talked about uh, nominal suffixes being valued for singular, being valued for plural, or being valued for nothing, yeah. And it seems like these nominal suffixes that are valued for singular and for plural, you can't compound or incorporate them in that tight way that you can these noun suffixes that have no number value. Mm, oh, okay. Think about that, Martin. That's another question for you. But I bring it up because, again, I mean, this talk touches on so many different things and uh, we don't yeah. get the opportunity to talk about but uh, about um, morphosyntax. But again, all of it, the, the riddle or the, or the, the catch seems to lie again with these nominal suffixes. And I laugh about this because you think that nominal suffixes would be done now. <laughs> there's there's still so much that needs to be done. There's so much that we don't know about how they affect the morphosyntax. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Thank you. Um, well, regarding the number uh, as, associated with these suffixes, that's something that's, that we're working on now, right? Um, so yeah, hopefully you'll, you'll be able to read more about that uh, soon. Um, but yeah, this thing about the uh, yeah compounds is something that I yeah didn't know anything about yet. So I'll have a look at your your dissertation again. I think it's not uh, in my dissertation. It's not in there. Something oh, that, that I've only important. come to think of very okay. recently. Okay. Okay. If you ever do write up, you know, write up some some information on this, then uh, I'll be happy to uh, to read it. But, yeah. So, okay. No. Let me. Yeah. Um, Michael, go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Mary, for your talk. Um, I'm interested to know about the semantic content of content of the of the nominalizers you have. For example, in this slide, mm -hmm. um, you have uh, uh, F for female. Um, uh -huh. Is there any regular um, uh, principle for like certain verbs take certain um, gender or? What guides this? If you have, of course, they, I mean, <laughs> Martin also, and 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 Eric can respond to this if you have an idea. Right. So that's a very good question. Uh, thank you. So I'm um, sorry, I'm trying to go right. Um, so there are a number of different uh, suffixes in 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 Iraq that can be used, uh, yeah, for normalization, and there are also there are actually a subset, uh, mostly it's of of kind of a larger set of suffixes that occur on nouns in in general. Um, and each suffix has, is associated with a certain gender value. So, for example, the, the a suffix, which is the most common, is, is feminine. And, but then this an suffix that you get with sing is, is masculine. Um, and so generally, um, yeah, I, I, I can't really think of a, I don't, yeah, hmm. there's not really a, a strong pattern between which suffix that noun uses and then or um and, or which gender that suffix has and and the verb although there are some there, there actually there are some patterns so for example if you have a verb like hurim here which has a, a imperfective uh, suffix then the normalizing suffix will be this uh, ing suffix and then or for example if you have a verb that ends in this, this t suffix for uh, uh, which is called middle voice then the, it it will be nominalized by uh, adding well not a suffix but by shortening the final uh, vowel and that, and so there are some patterns like that between the the verb and uh, but, but, yeah and, and which kind of uh, suffix is used and each suffix is associated with a certain gender but in terms of semantics i don't really think there are any very strong correlations there. So uh, yeah, I hope that uh, answers your question. Yeah, thank you. All right, Maybe I, Andrew I can that, all right. I think that's, yeah, thank you. I think that Andrew has a, has a follow up. Just Roland Kiesling, uh, for sort of taking a historical uh, approach to this, 
reconstructs a couple of these nominal suffixes as having a built-in semantics. The only one that can come to my head, mm. excuse me, is the is the OO being uh being uh, what is it some sort of product or some sort of uh some sort of outcome okay. or something like that maybe martin can 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 fix this but i think of the word for like uh, the word for excrement uh comes from mm -hmm. so that so the verb uh, and then you have uh, uh, is the mm -hmm. is the is is uh feces for example so okay. there's a couple at least that martin or that sorry that uh roland reconstructs with um with a uh, with semantics attached, but I don't know if he does it for all of them, and um, I don't know how far back and what the what the ultimate sort of sources of these would be. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah. Then I think we're through to questions for today. I'm gonna look at this list. Yep. Yeah. All right. Then I would just like to say thank you again uh, for your presentation, everyone for participating. Yeah, thank I'd you like for to take this opportunity me. to remind everyone that recordings of uh, the presentations can be found on the YouTube page, uh, and all entries are added to the bibliography. Looking ahead, the next webinar will be on Wednesday, the 29th of November, presented by Ahadi Molel from the Four Corners Cultural Program. And it's titled Nipo uh, Kwasa Babu Upo, I Am Because You Are, Cultural Diversity Among Four Ethnic Groups of Africa. Um, so thank you all again, and I look forward to seeing you at our next.